Chris Mannix covers the association for uh, Sports Illustrated. He was there last night. Uh, what'd you make of Lance Stevenson's comments and LeBron's game last night? That have any impact on LeBron? You know, I, I doubt that LeBron gets motivated by something Lance Stevenson said. I did think, and I wrote this after game three, that you know Lance got under his skin a little bit in the first quarter, but from the second quarter on, LeBron was totally locked in. And, and I had a conversation with Shane Batty about this after the game, and, and Shane described or characterized it as um, an annoyance with, with Lance Stevenson, but says that you know, over the last few weeks, LeBron has just been just so locked in on getting back to the finals, to winning a championship, that something Lance, who Lance Stevenson says doesn't really resonate with him. Yeah, and I, I don't know why I'm applauding Lance Stevenson for at least saying something and you know, trying to show a pulse here because there's a lot of fingers of blame to go around with Indiana. Lance Stevenson just didn't show up himself. It's one thing to say yeah. I'm, in, I'm in LeBron's head, uh, but the other guys too. I just don't know if Indiana. Maybe we've we've overrated Indiana when it comes to trying to beat Miami. And maybe I, Miami's just better. I, I I agree, and I think one thing that's been exposed throughout this playoffs is that Indiana has two significant flaws. Uh, to their roster. Uh, the point guard position, look, if you're Miami and you have three Hall of Famers, you can get away without having a dynamic point guard. But if you're Indiana, you need someone out there. I mean, you need a, a Tony Parker type, uh, Russell Westbrook, Rajon Rondo, or even a Jeff Teague at this point playing that position. They're just not getting enough from George Hill, who I think is more suited and best suited for that reserve role yeah. uh, coming off the bench. Uh, the second part of it is they don't have that floor spacer. They don't have Kyle Korver. They don't have Ray Allen. They don't have Mike Miller. They don't have any of those guys that can create space, the pa- or the driving lanes for Stevenson and George, or the, the space in the paint for David West and Roy Hibbert. If you're in the, uh, the pace in the offseason, one of the first things I would do is I would call Ray Allen's agent and say, what would it take? Every, we'll give you every available nickel we have to get Ray Allen here, because that's something they desperately need. A 38-year-old Ray Allen, you're going to open up your wallet? You know, Ray and I had a conversation the other night where he tells me that really for the last five years, he, he weighs himself before every game, and he stays between 203 and 205 pounds for every single game. He's the most well-conditioned athlete I've ever come across, this side of Floyd Mayweather, uh, I guess. But I, I think that with his... Uh, shooting ability, and with the fact that you don't ask him to do what a starter's supposed to do. You're talking about a bench guy playing yeah. 15 to 20 minutes per game. He could play for three or four more years. All right, tell me what's going on with the Memphis Grizzlies, because this is something that would be right out of Springer. It, it's bizarre, and you know all this came, coming about, came about because Dave Yeager, the Grizzlies head coach, uh, decided to come back. For some context there, the Grizzlies – you know, they gave Jaeger permission in a very bizarre move to interview with the Timberwolves, citing that you know Jaeger was from Minnesota, and it's amazing that they actually thought that was going to fly because you know, I don't care if if the Timberwolves played in the high school gym with Dave Jaeger's jersey on the wall, you don't allow your head coach just won 50 games to go somewhere else unless you didn't want him to be there. Now they bring him back. The owner says, "I really like him as a head coach." They fire the the two top executives in the organization. They supposedly this great communication, but what I unearthed was that there was a lot of controversy around Jaeger, or I want to say uh, issues between Jaeger and Parra early in the season, to the point where you know, Robert Parra, the owner, wanted to fire Dave Jaeger multiple times uh, early in the season over issues over playing time for a guy like Ed Davis who wanted to play big minutes over a, a, a dumb game of one-on-one that Parra was supposed to play with Tony Allen. So the issues of uh, between Jaeger and Parra ran deep wait, early Wait, wait, on, wait. So the owner, them. the owner wanted to play Tony Allen, the player, in a game one-on-one. He, well, remember, this is the same owner that challenged Michael Jordan to a game of one-on-one back in October. And they had a whole thing lined up, Dan. They had uh, video cameras set up. They had uh, a press release issue. They had a poster made up, called it the Battle of the Bluff between Para and Allen. And when that, that, that fight, or that fight, that, that uh, game got canceled, uh, you know, what I was told was that uh, Para blamed it uh, on Dave Yeager. Now, Yeager, and along with many people in the organization, as I wrote yesterday, mm-hmm. thought it was a stupid idea. What if Tony Allen tears his ACL playing one-on-one against an owner? But the reality of the situation was you're dealing with Tony Allen who, if you tell him something one day, he's probably not going to care about it the next. And Tony did agree to it, but everything that I heard was that Tony, from the second he admitted he agreed to do it, had decided he didn't want to do it anymore, and it was him that wanted the game called off. 
So this a lot of drama, Dan. This billionaire owner wants to be a star. It's I don't know if he wants to be a star, but I don't I just don't think he knows yet how to run a team. And, and I, I've said this before, and it gets lost in translation, that I think a guy like him is great for the NBA. He's got deep pockets. He's willing to spend. <laughs> he's passionate about it. But you have to know how to do things. You can't play your own players one-on-one. You can't you know, summarily you know, do what he's done with, with Dave Yeager over the last year. <laughs> if, if you want to hire a top, good top executive to run the team, you have to allow that mm. man to do it. You can't be involved in the personnel decision. Dan, one funny story that's come up is that you know Raymond Brothers, who's the agent for Zach Randolph, has said publicly he's had conversations with Para about an extension for Randolph. That's the worst idea in the world. Any agent would love to deal with an owner on a regular basis. They think they can get over on an owner better than they can get over on a general manager. If you're an owner like a Peter Holt or a Clay Bennett in Oklahoma City, your best move is to hire brilliant people to run your basketball department and let them do their jobs. Uh, give me a coaching update here in the final uh, 45 seconds here. Uh, so- some of these these openings right now. What do you hear? There, there is no update from the Knicks or the Lakers at the moment. The Knicks are waiting for Derek Fisher to finish his season to interview him. The Lakers, I have no idea what they're doing. They're interviewing Lionel Hollins, but they are in no rush whatsoever to get it, get a coach hired. What about Cleveland? Now, Cleveland is looking for a college coach. Uh, I would be surprised at this point, Dan, if they didn't hire, and I'm just throwing, I don't know exactly who it would be, but a Billy Donovan, Fred Hoiberg type, somebody from the college ranks, appears to be their top consideration. Would Donovan leave? I think at this point he would. He had a lot of kids leave after this year, a lot of seniors on that team in Florida. Uh, an opportunity like Cleveland to build a franchise from the ground up with that type of young talent and draft the number one overall pick, that's incredibly enticing to a coach. Thank you, Chris. All right, Dan. Chris Mannix, Sports Illustrated.